Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going, the hour is late afternoon. I'm going to try to give you a very picture story uh, and relatively data free um, ideas about uh, two decades of uh, exploring and serendipitous, making serendipitous discoveries in the uh, Laurentian Great Lakes, especially Lake Huron, and now we are expanding those studies to the rest of the Great Lakes. So, um, starting in uh, 2001, um, with funding from NOAA Ocean Exploration, we stumbled into these photosynthetic mats in shallow sinkholes and uh, chemosynthetic white mats like the ones that Alvin sees in deep seas, sub, uh, seeps and vents um, in the deep sink sinkholes of Lake Huron. All this didn't happen in a vacuum. We had incredible uh, team, teammates and collaborators. Um, Steve and I are uh, authors of this presentation just because we were there at the beginning and are still plugging away at life's persistent questions. So to give you the background, the Laurentian Great Lakes um, bedrock aquifer, if you look at the gray, dark gray areas, you will see that all the lower Great Lakes are underlain by limestone and dolomite. Limestone is very porous and erosive, and they make some of the best aquifers. Okay? Most of the world's wells go into limestone bedrock because they, they're full of like, like sponge. And consequently, they're all sedimentary rocks. They're also very erosive. So, uh, Paleozoic um, marine seas left their salts behind, you know, uh, 400 to 500 million years ago, uh, the Great Lakes Basin was covered by those seas, and they have left their salts behind. And aquifers were, you know, washing through them carried the high chloride and sulfates. Yeah, and the long conduit time takes away all the oxygen. Any carbon is respired and there's no oxygen. So conditions that probably prevailed in the early shallow seas of the Proterozoic, I'm talking 3.5 to 0.5 billion years ago. And how does the uh, um, sinkholes form? Rain percolates down these porous rocks, making, uh, making its way. And, uh, you know, who says the uh, water cannot rise uphill and then there's an impervious layer, uh, they can rise uphill and, um, and corrode and cause sinkholes, even in the bottom of the, sink of the Great Lakes. And um, the, the few sinkholes that I will focus on this study are, um, are in the center, center diagram. On the far uh, upper left, you will see on-land sinkholes. And on the lower left, you will see shallow sinkholes where you can wade into, see sulfur springs gurgling out and microbial mats underneath. And there are offshore sinkholes that we've explored in detail. Number one, the far upper right, you'll see, you can almost see from uh, flying over in a Cessna uh, uh, in, a, in a plane, you can see limestone cars slabs have got eroded away and like a semicircle or amphitheater uh, you can see in the upper um, lower uh, right and of course offshore aphotic sinkholes you can't see them from the surface at all I have no idea but site scan image image for example in the lower uh, right uh, reveals the ex possibility of those and then if you do an ROV search you you will uh, you will be able to see what, what what conditions prevail there. Let me focus on the first one, the Middle Island sinkhole. This is about 23 meters deep and um, about 10% of the ambient light that hits the surface gets down. So it is photic. And there is a region called the Alco where groundwater fills in and, and it has a sill at about 15 meters. So it fills with groundwater and pours out. And remember groundwater is heavier and saltier. So it, it hugs the ground. So as it flows out, it layers out almost like a chromatogram. It go, spreads out. And along the way, there is this brilliant purple mat of, of, of uh, cyanobacteria. And the white ones you see are chemosynthetic archaea. 
you can see the sharp discontinuity in the uh, in the uh, right um, uh, between the water uh, 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 lake water and the groundwater. Let's look in some conditions um, between lake water, standard Lake Huron water, and the venting groundwater. And you will readily see that the venting groundwater is high specific conductivity, meaning more salty, and that's confirmed by high both high chloride and high sulfate levels. Sorry, there's some artifact here, jumping slide. And most importantly, you'll see there's no oxygen, okay? No oxygen and high sulfate. These are the high sulfide you know, after it's been metabolized by sulfate reducing bacteria. These were the conditions that prevailed in the early earth, shallow seas. And presumably life was clinging in a thin biofilm in the shallow coastal areas okay, for the longest time ever before things got oxygenated and so on. So early Earth's shallow seas had the same conditions uh, as the modern day sinkholes that we see in the aphotic zone of Lake Huron. And a vertical profile here shows you in the summer, you have a double thermocline, okay? And in the lower bottom at the sinkhole, you know, where the groundwater flowing, you'll see this transition zone across which there is this incredibly sharp um, uh, oxycline and a picnocline um, and a thermocline all together. This is a great, great classroom instruction for oceanography or, or even limnology. What is in in, in this uh, in the in this what compose what composes these mats is a very biodiverse, um, taxonomically diverse and functionally versatile group of pigmented cyanobacteria and non-pigmented sulfur oxidizing archaea. Both are filamentous and both are motile, as we'll see. Okay, a cross section. This whole cross section is only about half a centimeter. Okay, and the very top is only about uh, two millimeters where you see purple mats and underneath white filamentous cyanobacteria. There are calcium carbonate crystals you can see in the intermediate area, but during the day, um, the pH goes up because of photosynthesis and calcium carbonate is precipitated, but at night, respiration reverses that pH and it dissolves. So, this would be reef building, uh, reef building mats like the stromatolites, but they are not reef building because uh, every day the pH resets and the carbonates precipitated is re-dissolved. But you'll see it's a perfect redox tower. Everything biogeochemically possible can happen. So this consortium is very versatile. Okay, probably the reason why they've survived um, a long time. So in the lab, we found they can be horizontally motile, okay? So my students dis disperse them in the lab in a petri dish and cut out with the GVSU logo or university logo and made them for, you know, you can make initials and this can, be, this can happen within and put a light on top. This can happen within hours. Okay? So millimeter, micrometer sized um, filaments are, are moving millimeter distances okay, within hours. So especially at the, at the change of day into night and night into day, as we'll see later. They're also capable of vertical movement. You place some um, shell pieces on intact cores, diver collected cores of these mats with mat sediment complex. You put them on top of the mat. Within hours, the, mat, the, the shell or pebbles disappear because the, the cyanobacteria rise up because they don't want, want shade, they want, to, they want to harvest light for photosynthesis. And during the process, they subduct, subduct these particles into the layer beneath, which is anaerobic. And you can see, this is a, if it worked in real life, it would be a great carbon accumulation mechanism because down below, there's no oxygen to oxidize the organic matter. As we'll see, they're very good, um, very good at burying carbon in this case. So the mat ecosystem, we have done benthic chamber studies. The carbon balance is nearly, nearly neutral. There's a slight excess of carbon, meaning there's some, some burial of carbon, but it seems like the annual mat growth is consumed you know, almost every day or over the whole season. But sub-bottom profiling shows that there's 16 meters of you know, very carbon-rich sediment. This is 20, 15 to 20% carbon 
This is super rich because the rest of the Great Lakes is like under 5% carbon. So 15, 16 meters are of carbon, um, and presumably this carbon is accumulated only in the last 10,000 10, years or so. Uh, that's based partly on lead, lead 210 and cesium dating. And th if this were true, it would make it, you know, that's like a meter or two every thousand years. That would make it the one of the, maybe the very highest carbon accumulation anywhere on the planet. So th these mats know how to bury carbon. The interesting thing with the sediment trap material, we speculated that all the carbon in the sediment would be the annual layers of mat material, but no, the, the signal in the sediment is all planktonic. It's because the mats don't like anything coming on top of them, they bury them down. So mats know how to bury carbon. Maybe it's not their own carbon, but planktonic carbon. So they're bi big biological sink for carbon. So we made expeditions to using a time-lapse camera to continually look at migration of the mats, vertical migration of mats. And you can have snapshots of three different areas. The middle one is diver images, so they're very clear, but you can clearly see at, during, at the end of the day, the, the image is very purple because the photosynthetic um, filaments have come up. At night, it's the, uh, it's the chemosynthetic white ones that have come up. There's so there's dial shift, um, shift journey. It's possible that at one time, and perhaps for a billion or, or so years, this one meter, millimeter journey was the, was the largest mass migra daily mass migration of life on this planet. So. Not, nothing very tiny about these tiny organisms. So this is the scenario we like to paint during the day. Um, the, the photosynthetic cyanobacteria come up to harvest the sun, sunlight. At night, the chemosynthetic white mats come up to harvest the hydrogen sulfide for chemosynthesis, their own carbon building process. So we did micro profiling last couple of years and um, under with intact diver collected cores under simulated light conditions and temperature conditions. And they show, you can look at the, there are 100 micrometer measurements, okay? So it's very tiny distances. And you can see during the day, there is oxygen generation. During the night, there's less oxygen production. And, and during, the, during the night, more hydrogen sulfide is produced. And uh, at night, uh, at, during the day, um, most of it's consumed and there's less. So this explains why um, well, photosynthetic organisms would come up during the light, to, night, during the day to harvest sunlight and chemosynthetic would, ones would come up to harvest the hydrogen sulfide at um, day. So a few um, simple draw down com conclusions of that. Photosynthetic mats move up at, during the day and there's net photosynthesis. This is a little bit complicated. I can discuss uh, later. There's two groups of photosynthetic organisms here, uh, both the oxygenic as we have in the modern day and the anoxygenic ones as we had in the, had in the ancient past. So you, know, you can see these organisms have still retain their original capacity to do, to do both types of photosynthesis. And at night, chemosynthetic ones come to harvest the hydrogen sulfide as the chemocline moves up. So the dial, dial vertical movements may have helped them mat build. You know, they interview and go up and down and help sequester carbon and release oxygen. So going to the deep sinkhole for a real quick trip. Remember, there's no light here. This is over 100 meters isobath. Um, so isolated sinkhole has no light at all. Side scan image is down in the bottom. Okay. And you can see the, um, uh, see the temperature and conductivity profile. Then when you hit the, hit the sinkhole, they both, uh, it's very distinct that you have arrived. And uh, ROV uh, mapping, like a, almost like a radiator grid, uh, over this nearly football sized area shows you hot spots of, uh, of warm, uh, high conductivity water coming out and also warmer temperature water. It's, uh, it's uh, 
kind of rivers, the groundwater coming out at all these sinkholes is about 9.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's the average uh, air temperature over 40, 45 degrees latitude, Northern Michigan um, over the last one millennia. So 9.5 degrees water is warmer than uh, Lake Huron water at 110 meters, which is about four degrees Celsius. So it's warmer and lighter, and um, but it's denser because it's got salts. Uh, so it uh, rises a bit and then uh, layers out uh, uh, and flows around. So life here you see is, is what, if you have seen those ocean um, documentaries, is what the Alvin sees around thermal vents and cold seeps of sulfur. Um, so we have the same communities of schemosynthetic bacteria, mostly Bigeotoas, the species uh, here too. And we used uh, something like the, probably the longest uh, tubing like for, uh, with peristaltic pumping in the far left, you can see it's like a spaghetti. For to reach the 110 meter sinkhole, we had an ROV take down 250 um, um, meters length of ROV tubing. And with the biggest ROV pump we could find, we pumped sample sap as the ROV saw it and the sensor sensed everything. So we knew where we were and we were able to make uh, some of the first uh, chemosynthetic measurements for the Great Lakes water column in these lakes. So it's not just here that in, uh, in Lake Huron, and even in Lake Huron in the last uh, five years, in the lower uh, bottom, you see we have, dozen, uh, we have discovered a dozen more sinkholes in the deep, deep portion. Um, and uh, recently, uh, the group from uh, uh, sub-bottom profiling in, uh, in Lake Michigan has, this, the, on the far left, you can see several um, potential sinkholes in Lake Michigan. And uh, last year, I was able to go to the to the part of the uh, for Lake Erie Basin uh, and explore this great, great sulfur spring. Uh, it has the same water characteristic, and even in, you know camera images show the same type of cyanobacterial com communities underneath. So I'm willing to bet there are hundreds, if not thousands, or hundreds of thousands of these sinkholes over the Great Lakes Basin, and we need to get a, get get a good idea of them about what amount of water, what quality of water is coming out of them. Obviously not all of them will fuel the same type of vibrant and mats because they are all, all necessarily not coming from the same marine evaporate layers, but um, definitely they contribute to our um, water levels. So where else on earth are mats like this? Okay, the, on the upper right is the Middle Island sinkhole. Um, you will see them in Antarctica, NSFS program studying this. Uh, you see, you know, in the Dry Valley Lakes, the far two left, uh, left images. You also see them in, in uh, lakes that are fed by sulfur springs, like this Lake Cadogno in uh, Switzerland. So they are ubiquitous, they're all over the world, but they are in refugia hiding because they don't have their original environment of low oxygen and high sulfur elsewhere in the generally oxygenated world of today. So we, uh, I also propose that these can be models for NASA to try, you know, especially, you know, in the Middle Island ice is up in the winter. You could, you could auger a hole and send a robot, practice sampling mats uh, for possible use in when we go to other, other extraterrestrial hydrospheres in search of life. So very quickly wrapping up, um, for the mo most of Earth's, um, Earth's life, it was, it's possible it was a mad world biosphere, okay? Uh, and uh, um, in the last uh, 500 million years or so, it, um, it helped set up the stage for the oxygenation, especially as the day length increased from you know, nearly six hours a day to the present day, 24 hours a day. So I'll conclude saying that time, water, and geological forces may have converged to create underwater sinkholes where oxygen poor, sulfur rich groundwater support prolific microbial mats resembling life on early earth. And they contribute to earth's extent, bio, extent biodiversity and are therefore worth conserving. And photosynthetic cyanobacteria in shallow sun, sunlit uh, sinkholes may be modern day analogs of the 
ancient produced, like whereas chemosynthetic mats in deep sinkholes are analogous to deep sea vent and seeps. Motile mat worlds like this may have been critical in surviving the turbulent Precambrian seas and oxygenating our planet. And modern day microbial mat communities on Earth could be useful working analog for our search for life elsewhere. And I will leave you with that. Thank you. I, th I think we have time for a question as we transition speakers here. And there is an online question. Uh, some, one of our online participants wants to know if anyone has measured mercury in these sinkholes. No, we tried once, but we were not very successful. Okay. It would seem that the, the, with the almost anaerobic conditions there, there would be even methylation. So it, it, it would be an, a really important direction of inquiry. Okay. Maybe if we can bring up the next talk, if you'll stand over here and do the next talk. Is there a question? Do you have, is there a mic? That, oh, okay. Well, the online people can't, yeah, can't hear the yelling. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll take hmm. it. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kim Galvez. I'm the chief scientist on Viking Octantis with Viking Expeditions. And I was wondering the question for the cyanobacteria and the microbial mats, are they precipitating anything? Are you seeing any kind of precipitation of carbonate or anything else that might contribute to the overall geologic processes that are down there? Yeah, I briefly touched on that. These are not um, reforming mats. Uh, like the microbialites and the stromatolites. Yeah. Now, they, they do precipitate carbon during the peak of their photosynthesis uh, in the afternoons, um, but that is uh, uh, dissolved again at night when the, when the respiration kicks in. Uh, it's dominant process and uh, they dissolve. So in net, net, there is no carbonate precipitation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 